after several great quarters, this one is not off to a healthy start. Thanks to the health insurers and Ralph Lauren. Also, what are the bonds telling us? Are they telling us we're getting three rate cuts this year? We shall see. Also, who's going to pick up the slack today? Where's the rotation? Where's the money going to go? Or is it just going to be kind of like a sell everything kind of day? We'll talk with Scott Redler at 835 about it. It's a Tuesday. We got some work to do here on Pre-Market Prep. Welcome to Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep. This is a volatile puppy here. It's all about execution styles and strategies. All right, folks, pretty much down from that closing price at 95 and a quarter. We're down 20 and a half handles, 52, 74, 75. Uh, the buck down a dime under 105, 104.66. Bonds leaking again down over a half a point under 118. If you want to worry about inflation, well, take a look at the crude chart up a buck 19.84.90. Gold up 24.60. Ripping silver waking up. That's up by uh, 65 cents, 25.72. And if there's risk off in the market, it's risk off in Bitcoin down $4,235. It's $66,145. Oh, wow. I'm just looking at that Bitcoin chart. I didn't see the uh, quintuplet, quintuplet top. Let's bring in Triple D. Triple D here. We always get the rotation. If they're no. selling something, they're buying something else. We don't have that day where it's a yeah. sea of red. What are they going to buy today? Oh, they'll find something, I'm sure. They're buying oil stocks. Oil has been going pretty good. They're buying some jug stocks because there's other problems in the healthcare. So you're getting rotation within the XLV. And this is probably the major story of the day. XLV is getting hit hard. But if you look here, it's the healthcare medicare stocks that are really getting hammered here ab bring him in here as well because this is the headline of the day huge down move for humana unh cvs all getting just crushed here what is this headline here medicare news not good for these healthcare providers yeah, so this came, I uh, believe, last night uh, that federal payments to Medicare insurers next year will come in lower than Wall Street had expected. So what happened was there was a proposal from the government in January um, that and the insurers said, look, these rates are too low. The amount of money that will go from the federal government, from Medicare to the insurers was too low. Analysts were saying they had predicted that the final rates would be significantly higher than that proposal that we got in January. Instead, that propose or instead the rates are basically identical to that proposal in January, and you're seeing those stocks get crushed today on this. So again, that's less money going from uh, the Medicare program this year to the insurers than what was expected by analysts by Wall Street. Um, which I mean, you can just see the impact on all of these stocks. UNH, yeah. uh, look, looking at the chart here, I mean. Uh, and this stock, I mean, I'm in this stock in my long term portfolio has been a monster over the past three years, but, oh. you know, clearly not uh, not performing well off this news today. Um, and again, they've had runs to your point here. Lots of money has been sitting and hiding here saying, you know, this is the safest spot to be when you're thinking a recession was going to come. You're like, oh, healthcare, you know, insurers here are not not a bad place to be. You know, some of that trade could come off here, too. Usually, when you get this Medicare news, it seems like it's buying opportunities. These things get hit. We've seen them get hit on this stuff before. And then they eventually, a few days later, come back and scoop them up. Um, I'll just give you the list of them here, Joe. You can go through them quickly. The the, bit, the major names you're obviously going to look at is CBS, UNH, and Humana is getting hit the most. Then you can look at ELV, Elevance Health. You could look at CI. You could look at CNC, Centene. A look at MOH. Um, sometimes you get the hospital stocks. Um, they can have weird moves off this. Sometimes I've actually seen them rally off of this news here before, but they're just sitting here and they're slightly down here as well. HCA, THC. Um, that, so these are the stocks that are moving. Then your ETFs, obviously XLV, if you're wondering why that's down, it's all because of that. And then the rotation, you know, within the index, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes as well. But let's just go back, you know, technicals on Let's go to uh, UNH here because it's widely owned, like AB said. 
It's down about 5% here in the pre-market, getting hit pretty hard. Joel, technical levels, anything on this? Uh, well, I'm gonna, I'll am gonna. i give you a technical level here, but it just seems like if you're owning these stocks, you're just fighting the news flow. You know, it's just time and time again. I mean, it's happened, you know, it's, you know, sometimes you get good news, you know, you like NVIDIA, good news, good news, upgrade, you know, price target. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then you get in stocks where like the news and yeah, they it has a recovery uh, from the news. But right now, I mean, you know, you really got to have a strong stomach to be own, owning these stocks because it just seems like. This is not one. I mean, you can look at the UNH chart. It, uh, it's got a lot. It seems like a couple times a year we get these headlines are really yeah, hammering yeah. the stock down. Something with Medicare. Like I've got them grouped, and you know, I know. Okay, well, there's Medicare news. Here it is. These are the stocks that are likely to get hit the most. These are likely stocks that are going to still get hit. These are the ETFs that are going to be affected. I mean, even the DIA was affected here. You know, because it's such a UNH component here. Like last night, DIA yeah. Got, yeah. like. Dow getting hit harder because you and H huge component because of the price weighted stock, high price stock. So it's it's definitely um, you know on traders' radar here today. And then I just wanted to talk about the rotation with the in the index as well because if you look at the XLV with it being you know obviously U N H I believe if I go and look is one of the major components if not the biggest component. I'll just bring that up here right now. Here we'll go to the ETF go into the XLV and this is something we don't do often with the XLV because it's usually not the major mover here but it is today Eli Lilly is actually number one now because it's had such a big move it's 11 percent but UNH is 8.3 so it's a huge number in there and then if you go further down Alavance Health is in there which is 2.2 and it's getting smacked around CI is in there 1.94 so you can say like 13 14 CBS is in there 1.83 good estimate that 15 percent of the index is getting hammered here today so with XLV only down 0.63 percent they're like oh well we'll buy ourselves a little lily to offset if you're an arbitrager we'll buy ourselves maybe a little bit of merc or something else like that you know johnson johnson none of those stocks have moved but just be careful and watch lily's up a little bit you may see some of those other drug stocks go up for two reasons one defense because the overall market is getting hit here today and two is the rotation within the index itself so i actually think like stocks like johnson and johnson um, Merck, I have a small position in stocks like, you know, Abbey, potentially maybe Abbott Labs, um, Pfizer, maybe. And I have a small position in that too, trading positions. I think some of those stocks could actually go up here today. I'll tell you, Humana is the worst in breed here. I mean, this one is just even worst in breed long time. I mean, this peaked worst in 2022, yeah. 573, absolutely obliterating the former low of the move at 334. You're 18 sticks below that. UNH seems to be holding up a little bit better. You did take out the low of the move. I can only give you a two star here at 468.19. Because you did trade the over, you know, there was a reaction in the pre-market down to 457. Uh, but see what happens at four, four, uh, 468 level UNH, but it's just hovering near. So don't know if we'll get to the pre-market low. Uh, no one's really made Elevance Health. Now that's down 20s. I, I didn't see anyone make a trade in that. That's a little higher price stock and Molina is a higher price stock too. CVS probably wishes they never would have bought Aetna. Uh, that's down uh, four bucks here. That's it's what Aetna. hits CVS always. And you think like, why doesn't Walgreens get hit if CVS is getting hit? Because Wal because exactly what Joel just said, CVS went out and bought Aetna a number of years ago. So now they're involved in this health insurance and WBA is not. That's why WBA ignores, although WBA is a mess in itself, which we've talked about. Before. <laughs> oh, I look at that. Um, and then UNH is also was dealing with that major uh, data breach. I don't know if people are uh, still dealing with that. I'm dealing with that a little bit uh, at the pharmacy on uh, one of my uh, prescriptions. So, I mean, it's just bad news flow. I mean, it just, you know, get out of the way. Wait for some good news. Uh, yeah, well, and I'm trying to figure out exactly what this will mean for Medicare patients. I believe, from what I'm seeing, I believe it it's not going to increase any costs for them. It's basically just the insurance companies are going to be eating these costs, which means that if I had to guess, these insurance companies will probably go out and try to find some uh, other ways to save money to make up for this law for the money they're not getting from the government. But um, because I mean, it would, it would seem like a very silly move, right? If, if the administration right now did something that would, uh, you know, 
piss off all the people that use Medicare right now. So, uh, I, I mean, I, I don't know. It just seems like right now all the Medicare and Medicaid services, any stock that has exposure to that getting hit on this news. But we'll we'll need some time to see exactly what the full impacts are for the actual people that use these services. Well, that's your main story of the day. And then we've got lots of other little stories here, too. We're going to get Tesla deliveries here as well. And I don't believe they are out yet, but we're expecting those this morning. So if we get those during the show, we'll obviously go to them. Let's talk this chump stock because it's been getting okay, hit yeah. here, AB, um, the last few days. Obviously, you know, we, we had the conversion, you know, over from the DWAC to the DJT. And the thing just exploded. The low cape became tough and still tough. Can't figure it out um 79 38 it got up to but now in three days boom 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 it's right back down to where it was when it was dwac but now it feels like the luster has gone from this thing too and this thing just you know really getting hit hard so people who were chasing you know saying wow who cares you know this is the next game stop let's go while well, they're starting to care here and we know the fundamentals aren't behind this yeah, so when the stock went public and popped, obviously, I mean, you know, the people that were talking about the fundamentals, it was, okay, this company did $5 million in revenue and it's trading at, you know, $9 billion, whatever it is. Then the company came out and said, not only did we only have $5 million in revenue, but we had an operating loss of more than $50 million. And the regulatory, <laughs> now that the company's public, right, it has to do all these regulatory SEC filings and said it expects these operating losses to continue. And that, you know, I mean, as bad as the fundamentals, the mismatch in the fundamentals and the valuation of the company were last week, then once you got this news coming out of the after the actual filing, the regulatory filing, it looks so much worse. So, I mean, it's not a, a big surprise to see this sell off. Frankly, I'm surprised it's, it's, it's trading even where it's at now. Um, you know, I, when I talked about this, I, I don't know if it was on this show or the, or the other show we we're doing, but, uh, you know, it's like, if you want to trade it intraday, you know, whatever, go ahead. But if you're holding this stock, like it's, you know, I mean, you, 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 it, that's a, a big risk. I would, I would say in your portfolio. So I'm not saying this, the story's over, like this thing can obviously run. We've seen in the past few years, stocks that trade not matched up with their valuation whatsoever. And it seems like a lot what the market has become now. Um, but again, I mean, like trading it intraday is one thing. I would not want to hold this though overnight at all because you're at risk of any sort of filing, any sort of company announcement bringing this thing down another 20% or more. And the short is very difficult here. And to Spinner's point, definitely a short squeeze here off the of DWAC. Some people might have had it from the conversion. And then the short became tough. I still don't have a located IB, but if I did, they got me the rate. The rate is 789% <laughs> of year. So if you are shorting this, it's actually costing you three, it's costing you over 2.16% per day. So it costs you 2% per day. So what does that mean? It means if the stock goes down 2% and you're short, you break even. That's a tough short too. So, you know, you can say, oh yeah, short this. One, it's hard to get the borrow. Two, the borrow is so expensive, it's almost cost prohibitive because if it falls less than 2% a day, then you're losing. I mean, yesterday you would have made, the day before you would have made, but you would have got crushed, you know, a few days ago. So, I mean, nothing goes straight down, but they're pricing in, you know, at 789% a year, down 2% a day. You know, they're, they're pricing this thing to go, you know, basically every 50 days to go to zero. So, I mean, it made it really tough to short the thing. I, I almost would say, and you got I don't a good theory on there. this one. This well, is not a, very... a theory, not a theory, not a theory at all, but I bet there's a few people who maybe own this stock and are lending it out, maybe even some institutions who might own this and lend it out. And if you, one thing I will say is if you own this stock and you're not lending it out, you are crazy, crazy, because that is huge money. Like, it's like, you're going to give me, you know, and again, at IB, they typically give you half of it. So if it's 789%, they're keeping, you know, four, let's round it up to 800 for simplicity purposes. Say it's mm -hmm. 800%. They give you 400 a year. I mean, they're giving you over a percent a day. So, I mean, they're giving you over 50 cents a day just to own this thing. It's like a perpetual dividend it's giving you. Make sure, you know, talk to, you know, your brokerage. A lot of your brokers don't pass those through. Like if you're buying this thing at Robinhood, fairly confident you're probably going to get zero. So, I mean, that's the problem of being, you know, with a brokerage that isn't going to, you know, make sure you're, if you're, you know, and I'm involved at IB, I'm, I'm, I'm involved in the lending program. So if I'm long a security overnight, I can get a good rate. I lend it out. And they give me half of what they get back, which is pretty darn good. It's not typical on the street, 
Some of your other major brokers might not give you that much either. IB has always been aggressive with what they give out. That's why I love that brokerage. But I mean, you know, Robinhood, are they going to give you anything? I don't think so. I'm not even sure they give you anything at all. So that's one thing to consider. But if you own this thing, you got to be lending it out. Yeah. Uh, or go ahead. Game. No. Yeah. Uh, Dennis, actually, all the things that came out and those those filings and everything uh, were, I mean, if we roll the, the tape back from last Wednesday or Thursday, those uh -huh. are exactly the things that you said. And then uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, sometimes Barron's, uh, you know, move stocks sometimes is done. It doesn't. Uh, but if you uh, read Paul LaMonica, a longtime friend of the show, uh, his article on DJT in Barron's over the weekend spelled out exactly what Dennis talked about last week. Uh, so, I mean, if yeah, the if, fundamentals if, are not here to support the price. The you one, let the only thing supporting the price is the difficult locate, you know, because it's very hard to find on the street and the borrow. And there's probably some institutions that might actually be like, man, I think it'll fall less than 2% a day. So I'm going to jump in here and actually buy the stock and lend it out. And it's going to pay me, you know, because maybe some institutions going to even get a better rate. You know, go, if you're a huge hedge fund, let's just say you're a huge hedge fund, you probably can do, negotiate that rate to a certain extent. Say, ah, I'll take my shot, own a little bit of this. And, you know, you're going to pay me right now. The take in, you know, what the shorts are paying is over 3% a day at IBM. Again, there may be some better rates out there elsewhere, but, you know, I'm sure that, you know, it's going to be really high wherever you are, but they might be like, man, I could get 3% a day. Well, if, you know, the, if the broker takes one, I get two. That wouldn't be that bad either. Maybe it falls less than 2% a day. So those are all considerations. Market, you know, the, the market structure stuff behind it, really, you know, the short stuff behind it. That's supporting the price to a certain extent. But eventually, what will happen is that locate will get easier. Eventually, there'll be less people who are wanting to own, own the stock or short the stock. And eventually, the stock probably you know goes a lot lower just because the fundamentals aren't behind it. We don't know the timing of that. Could there be another short squeeze? Yeah, that's what's already a short squeeze. It can happen. But the stock could, you know, from a fundamental perspective, the stock is worth a hell of a lot less than 47 bucks. And when you load out a stock, you can still sell it out of your portfolio. You can still actively trade it. So Yeah. Exactly. Oh, yeah. You don't even do that stuff behind the scenes. Like once I sell, so the lending behind the scenes, and I'm involved in the IB lending, you know, securities and lending. I have it on all of my stocks. So if I own something, they're automatically lending it behind. I go to, I sell it, then they automatically bring it back in. And, you know, obviously with the two day settlement, you know, they've got the two days to find it. But now I guess it was one day settlement we've gone to. So, you know, that gets more. Dead. That's a that's a tricky thing, Joel, with, you know, people say, why don't we have, you know, instantaneous settlement? They just settle right away. We have all these other mechanics behind it. Like, OK, I sell the stock. Well, somebody lent it. Are you instantaneously calling them in if you can't find the borrow. I mean, you give them at least a day to go try to borrow it from somebody else. So you don't have to call that other short in. That's what causes short squeezes. You know, there's exactly. a little bit of a point here. As you continue to bring down that settlement, we went from three days to two days to one day. As you continue to bring that in, it becomes more difficult, you know, to for the lenders exactly. to, you know, quickly find those low locates because you cannot. So the mechanics, you cannot just short a stock, sell it short without having a locate, meaning you found the shares to actually sell short. You know, this is, you know, they've, they've cracked down this. 20 years ago it was a wild west. People are naked, shorting, and lots of that going on. That doesn't happen. The, the fines are significant here now. The only people we know who can naked short are obviously the market makers who have the exemption. So that's different. But if you're just a normal hedge fund and you're sitting here, you got to go get a borrow. Like if I don't go get a borrow and I just start naked shorting stuff here, I'm going to get fined substantially and potentially get charged. So I would never, you know, just go and, you know, just short something without, a, a, without an actual locate. And my brokerage won't even allow me to do it. Like there's no way for me to physically do that. So, I mean, so the naked shorting is something that's done by market makers and they have the exemption and that's a different story. But there's probably hedge funds that look like, wow, 789%. That's a hell of a lot of money. Like, yeah, typically, yeah, you'd have like, to Like typically your borrow rates, I just want to continue just one second sure. because people no. don't know about this stuff. Typically your borrow rates, you know, are like fractions of a percent, like 0.25%, 0.3%, like XLE is 0.41%. I'm just looking at the different rates. You know, they're very, very, very low. You know, and we're talking a year, not a day. Like, you know, like Wells Fargo, 0.42% per year. So you can hold that thing short the entire year and it only costs you 0.42%. You know, those are, you know, and, and, and again, those fees do add up. So you have to consider them. But I have it right on my brokerage. When I go to short something, I always know what it's costing me. When I short something like DJT, at 
tough. Even if I had a locate, like I said, it's got to fall 3% a day for me to break even. Uh, it, I just, well, no, you know, yeah, 2% a day. Yeah. And, and just looking at the, the dynamics of what you're talking about, if that, if that's going to play out in the market, if institutions are going to look at it, then you're going to see a technical pattern that supports that. And, you know, right, right now, you know, where can I call 45 to bottom right now? Not right now. Uh, you know, I see three lows under 40 because if you're going to employ the strategy, you're going to have to frown and average down. I mean, there's just, you know, like, oh, I'm not going to buy 100,000 shares at 4730. And, uh, you know, oh, I'm, yeah, it's fine. I'll be OK on this one because of the buy rate. It's going to be something where you're going to have to work, work yourself. You're going to have to have one hell of a spreadsheet to work in to see where your break even points, you know, fall. Because especially when you have a fall like yesterday, you employing that strategy yesterday, you're already down, you know, 2.79%. But a very, very unique. We just got to talk about Reddit too um, yep. on this. I mean, yep. Reddit. Mm. Let's give me, I'll give you the borrow rate on Reddit here too. And it's not like just comparatively, it's a lot less, but it's 18% a year. I mean, that's, you can, you know, 18% a year, you know, 365 divided by 18, you know, you're talking pennies a day. You know, compared to that other one, which is you know insane. So I mean, the red, it, you can swallow the borrow rate here a little bit. The locate's fine at Reddit, no no problem to get it. Um, but yeah, talk Reddit. Uh, yeah. The only thing I'd ask about that is where where was it supposed to come out? Was it like thirty four, thirty five? Yeah, was that thirty four yeah. dollars? Yeah, I, that's why I say there'd be support. I really thought yeah. this thing was going to undercut the rally. You know, you know, we all, they always cut the low. And uh, I was talking with Gene about it, and I just I and I, I made a little lunch bet with them because I was really confident. I think like after this day that it was like going to undercut that IP, you know, suck people in on this one, and then it just ripped my face off. But it did eventually come down to undercut. I would say you know look for that 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 pricing if you're looking to buy this long term. That's where the street valued it. Let's see if it gets back down to that area. Yeah, and you did have some insiders sell in in Reddit uh, shortly oh, yeah. after the IPO, the CFO, as well as the CEO selling millions of dollars of shares. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, you, you see that often after an IPO, at least when they're allowed to. I mean, it, it seems like there wasn't much of a any sort of lockup period here. Of course, there is on, on DJT. Um, but again, I mean, this one was probably trading not really in in line with its valuation i mean I, reddit's huge but i always thought like the best comparison to reddit at least on the public markets was when twitter was publicly traded and twitter never really did that well because the other social media stocks i mean meta has other things going for it that you know that's doing that uh makes it a lot more than just facebook but if you were if you were trading uh, Twitter back in the day when it was publicly traded, it was always a dog, even when uh, the other technology stocks and Facebook and, and these uh -huh. other ones were doing well. Twitter never really took off. And so Reddit, uh, I mean, it, it, it's, you know, I mean, th there's volatility here. So you could be trading right. it. But again, I just wouldn't want I wouldn't in this environment with rates rising and all this stuff be comfortable holding a stock that's trading so far away from its like real value or from its real yeah, valuation right now, uh, the fundamentals. And so Reddit right now, let's see, in the last five days has gone, or in the last, from its highs, from $65 has gone down about 30% now. So we'll see if there's another sort of short squeeze to happen here. But either way, Reddit continuing to, to trade lower this morning, down a percent. Um, Joel, do we have any technicals on this? The direct comps, just yeah. to keep that conversation going because you're doing the comps. I mean, I would look at Pinterest. I would look okay. at Snapchat more than Meta because, again, you know, not the same thing, obviously. You know, with the different businesses, you're talking on, you know, you're talking, you know, a social media platform there. That's, you know, Reddit, it's, it Pinterest, they're looking at pictures. It's not. But, again, we can, you know, I think these are the probably the best comps that we've got from a public perspective here, Aaron. Uh, Pinterest trades with a PE of 28 and $23 billion market cap. If we go over to Snapchat, which we know both of these stocks are way off from where they were at one time, um, Snapchat PE is a bazillion because they don't make money. One point one thousand, so they must have made a penny, and it's eighteen billion too. So it's difficult. But you know, you could look at the market caps here and say, well, Reddit's only seven billion. You got Snapchat at eighteen and Pinterest twenty-eight. You know, maybe there's an argument there that Reddit is actually one of the cheaper ones. Price to sales metrics is eight point four on on Reddit. 
and I'm, again, I'm just grabbing these from Pro. I haven't you know verified it all, but Pro usually does a pretty good job with some of this stuff. Snapchat's price sales only 3.9. So if you look at it from that metric, oh. now it starts to look expensive. And Pinterest price to sales is 7.8, which is around the same thing as Reddit. So I mean, it's not like Trump. It, Reddit's not like the Trump stock. You know, I don't know if there's an immediate path to profitability, but we're not talking, you know, billions and billions of dollars for a company that's, you know, got 10 million in revenue or whatever the hell they did. So um, different story, like the Trump stock. Or do we have the metrics of what's trading to price to sales? Yeah, it's trading a thousand times sales. <laughs> you know, like DJT is trading a thousand times sales, right? It's trading eight times sales. So, I mean, those sales are probably going to go up. It's not going to continue to be a thousand times sales. But- They'll get more revenue coming in, but it's just trying to give you a feel that, we have one stock that has no, you know, business whatsoever trading at the price where it's at, you know, full GME or AMC, you know, you know, social media short squeeze type going on. And then you have Reddit where, well, there's some business here. Like it's trading the same price to sales as basically Pinterest. So, I mean, it's not completely insane. Right. And so, but for these social media companies that aren't meta, because again, meta has all these different arms that, you know, they, they pull to make money on. It's not just purely a social media play. Um, but for the social media companies, right? Like the most of that money's coming in from advertisers. Uh, what do advertisers want? A lot of users. So Reddit has about 75 million daily active users. That's a lot. Snapchat, has 415 million daily active users, so more than five times the amount yeah. of Reddit. Now, will advertisers want to pay a like a little bit more of a premium to advertise on Reddit compared to Snapchat? I'd argue yes, because the user base is slightly older, so they have more money to spend. Whereas Snapchat is a lot of like you know sub twenty year olds. They don't sure. they don't got money to spend, so what's the point of advertising to them? But at the end of the day, I don't think that premium makes up for that. You know, the five times so. Uh, not surprising to see Snapchat trading, you know, at about an eighteen billion dollar valuation compared to um, compared to Reddit's uh, right now. But I mean, th- and that's the thing with Snapchat is like, it, you know, it's been a dog. It's obviously beaten up, trading around eleven dollars right now. But with that huge user base, like, it it could be a sleeping giant if they actually figure out how to monetize those users. But again, I think that's the biggest kick is that just that advertisers don't get that much bang for their buck on snapchat when you're advertising to people that don't have money well there's one yeah. major difference between pins and snapchat um you know besides the platforms and everything and you know sometimes we talked about activists getting it right and sometimes they get it wrong well elliot is totally got pins right i mean he has been supporting that stock for over two years and you know, that, that you don't see anybody. The activism in there. We kept talking about that, Joel, when it was 24, 25 and say, we got Elliot support down here, you know, and that's why we were making arguments that even though maybe the valuation metrics weren't that attractive, it just wouldn't go down. Even in 2023, when everything was going down or 2022, when everything was going down, I mean, that's the better year to we say about it. It was yep. holding up, holding up, holding up. And Elliot support was in there. And I mean, Let's look at how you use these platforms. Like Snapchat is mainly a communication network where people are communicating with other people. When you go on Pinterest, you are you're looking for something. things. Yep. Yeah, and then not from them, but you're looking for things like, you know, like if I can get, you would rather, if you were an advertiser, I would much rather get in front of the eyes of a Pinterest user than a Snapchat user. So I probably say more because when you go on, like I'm looking at my house, you know, and I'm looking like my wife when she was building the house was on Pinterest and looking at all the different types of molding and all the different types of, you know, windows and all the different types, every single thing. Well, if you're selling that stuff, you get in front, it's like, oh, I want that. Where can I buy that? That's where I can get it from. So think about that, you know, as opposed to Snapchat, where you're just communicating with other people and they're throwing advertisements in your face and you're trying to get rid of them. It's why Google's model has always been so good, because when you go on Google, you are actually searching for a product or searching for something, you know, and then it gives it to you. And, you know, and in some cases, you're searching for the product, you get the product right in your face, sponsored ad right off the bat. Those clicks are worth more money. So the Pinterest setup is worth more, probably more than a Reddit where Reddit is, again, more of a Snapchat communication network. You're not going on Reddit necessarily to buy molding. You know, like you're going there maybe to find out some information about something, and maybe there's that aspect. But it's more communication as opposed to I'm looking to buy something. I just want to make a quick note here, if you're paying attention or not, but uh, 
Google made a new all time high yesterday. Did it really? Really? Yeah. Yeah. Wait, so uh, before we move wow. on to, because I know we're going to talk some retail stocks in a second, I, I had another media uh, comment, I guess, or, or, or thing to bring up. I don't know. I, I don't think we've talked about this stock, at least since I've been on this show. I, I'm sure uh -oh. you guys rarely ever talk about this stock. It's a media stock. Can you, can you guess where I'm going, Joel? Uh, Warner Brothers? <laughs> it's not BuzzFeed. Nope. Um, Rumble? Nope. All right. New York Times, ticker NYT. We don't talk okay. to New York Times very oh, often. Oh, boy. You're going to so, get the chat, man. So, so this okay, time, okay, well, here's the thing is I know New York Times is polarizing. Here, People don't read articles anymore. I don't even, I got, you know, I, I, sometimes someone will send me a New York Times article. I'll read it here and there, whatever. What's interesting to me here is I've been seeing more and more people, like younger people too, on, on Twitter, on different social medias, sharing the the games on new york times and it's not just wordle anymore they got a new one called connections which has more than billions of plays and new york times is growing their uh their their digital revenue through these games and i don't know i mean i don't think it's going to be enough to like you know boost this stock a lot but it seems like new york times is kind of pivoting and saying hey well if people aren't paying for online subscriptions anymore if people aren't reading articles they'll play these silly little games and now they're advertising more on them so i was curious to hear in the chat are you guys playing wordle still are you playing connections are you doing the new york times i bet you not i bet you not dennis well, you doing wordle anymore no i did it for like a good six months there when it was the fat i haven't even looked at it ever since oh yeah it's exciting you wake up and you do your first word of the day even when you're waking up out of bed like two years ago it's like oh, i'm trying to wake up well let's do the word to get my brain working and it was good like two three four months i was very you know doing it you had the streak going i had like a 51 day streak going I was like, yeah, this is fun. I'll do this forever. And now it's gone. I don't even, I haven't crossed my mind. Wordle has probably not crossed my mind in six months. I can tell you just brought it up right now. And I was an avid user two or three years ago. That's a problem for Wordle. Have you adjusted to daylight savings? No. See, no. I see a lot of people like Mary in the chat that play connections every single day. That's like one of their newer games. Well, maybe that's the thing is that one of these games gets hot. People share their results like they did with Wordle. And then it kind of, it kind of, Doc and Dave's got to figure it out. That's yeah. That's, he there does you go. Instead of Wordle. Right uh, there. But, that's but, where what, it's what, not. what this connections game did yesterday. Cause it's like they, they do words and you have to try to figure out how to match up the words into groups of four. Instead of words, they did emojis and people freaked out. And it was like their idea of an April fool's joke. So I think I saw a little bit more of it yesterday on Twitter of people freaking. I saw like, I kid you not dozens of posts about this New York times game on, on Twitter yesterday. And that's what kind of got my head. I was like, man, more people are playing this than I thought. And like, New York Times is finding some way to bring revenue in on this, but let's move on from Rivian the numbers. Stock. We have Rivian breaking right now. Rivian. Here. Deliveries are actually beating, I believe, the estimates here. Uh, give us those numbers here if you've got them, Aaron. They just crossed the tape at yep, 831. Rivian produced about 14,000 vehicles at Normal Illinois Manufacturing Facility and delivered 13,588 vehicles in Q1. Company reaffirms 2024 annual production guidance of 57,000 total vehicles. Um, I don't have the estimates there that we were looking for, but it, I mean, let's see. It looks like stocks trading down about 2%. It was, it was probably it, trading it down up. ahead of it. Yeah. Traded up to 11.59, man. You want to know why? Because the estimates, so I've got it here. The Q1 estimates were only 11,893, so they beat the Q1 estimates. But then the kicker is that 57,000. Well, they're saying they reaffirmed that. They didn't bring that up. So I'm like, okay, well, the quarter was pretty good, but you didn't raise it, you know, for the full year. So I think the algos saw the original. Algos just buy on the headline. See the original, oh, B, Rivian, B, B, bye, 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 bye. And then there, now there's other people coming in here and saying, hey, wait a second here. But they didn't raise the full year. So, I mean, they had an okay quarter, but they aren't saying great things for the full year. So that's why it's come back down. Now, with that being said, depends how much media runs with this headline. Because right now, CNBC is pumping the 13,588 on their screen, which is a, definitely a B. Phil Bowes on there. Nobody knows. Phil Bowes is very uh, educated in this area. So, I mean, nobody knows more about the automotive industry from a media perspective than Phil Bow. So he's on there right now talking. So sometimes it's what he says can move stocks too. So he could be on there and saying, well, this is a pretty good number. And the Bible goes like, bye, Philip Wilson, bye. bye. <laughs> I love you. So, I mean, it's media influence here to a certain extent, but Rivian's been in the gutter. I mean, the stock's been in the gutter. Could it get a lift here, you know, on these numbers? It's possible. We're digesting these numbers. We're four minutes after. So hard to say where we're going to go from here. Just, you know, stock has been just hit so hard.
Sneaky rallies at Ford and GM. I'm telling you, they're really bucking the trend here. Uh, Ford finally broke out over 13, and GM has yeah. just been, I Ford. know, terrible long-term investment. I know that, but you cannot argue with the performance in the good old Detroit City General Motors here, Government Motors, whatever you call it. That's one heck of a streak. Go with the Mo is saying that he's been seeing Rivians ever. I think I feel like I've been seeing more and more of them too, but that might be one of those things where you just notice them more than you know other cars you see. I think I'm officially about to buy Rivian stock because I want I can't I want take it anymore. Yeah, well, I want I want the company to have a little bit more money so that it can <laughs> it can survive for two more years, so I can buy their new car that's supposed to come out. In 2026. <laughs> I can buy the stocks, I can buy the car. Yeah, I'm gonna buy the stocks because if I don't buy the stock and then it goes under, then I'm not uh, gonna be able to buy the car in two years. So. Uh, you know, but you'll get them cheaper. Look at the Fisker deals here now. Do we have? Can we go to the Fisker site here? Fisker is like 30, 40 percent off MSRP here right now. Really? Fisker sales. So yeah, I mean, I, if Rivian go under, then you get them really cheap. Well, these I cars. Fisker, Fisker's I thought, gone. I, I didn't even know Fisker had like cars on the to the market. Are they? they, how many they, they whatever have? is out there right now, they are discounting them. I saw <laughs> that. You know, I was saying, yeah, they're discounting because well, they need they need whatever cash they can get. Major sales on the Fisker models. If you can get them out, whatever is out there, they are cheap right now. What happens? We need, if you we buy need Red Fisker? Dog here. We need Red Dog yeah. to, to get come in and here. Save right. this market. Come on. Where's Red Dog? We got Scott Redler from T3 Trading hanging out. Let's bring him on. <laughs> All right, Red Dog. Scott Redler from T3 Trading. Scott, how you doing this morning? I'm doing great. How you guys doing? Good. It's good to bring you back on. You've got the eerie background. Is that because we have some eerie markets today? Something like that. I like to play a little bit. You know, lately, a lot of people know me as like the ice barrel trader or the sauna trader. So I figure Riley saw I might as well be broadcasting from a little <laughs> Russian or Ukrainian bathhouse in uh, Eastern Europe. <laughs> there you go. Um, well, what have nice. you been watching, Scott? I mean, we, we've had a lot of of really, you know, big headlines, crazy market moves since the last time we've had you on. What's been top of my, top of mind for you? Well, it's a new quarter, right? So when you get a new quarter, you get new relationships, you get new sectors in play. You got to see if existing trends continue. You have to see if new trends start. Um, so whenever you like, you see a chart like this of the spies, and you see such a long period of an ascending channel like this. You know, everyone always wants it to break or everyone's calling for it to break. But at this point, it's just traveling along it. Um, so I, I just like to show this for a little perspective on how far we've come. But, you know, the trend is your friend. Some people thought it was going to end as soon as we got above 479. Then they thought it would try and, you know, break here. And then you had another spot here. And, and here we are. So, you know, I came into this, you know, to this quarter, you know, pretty, you know, with a few longs, a few shorts, not sure. You know, if the AI semiconductor trade was going to change, if any of the, you know, whatever was left of the Magnificent Seven, the Fab Four, or even the, the Lonely Two, you know, what was going to be able to make higher highs. And after yesterday, it told me I need to reduce a little risk. I have I have some SPY puts on. I've sold some SPY premium. I do, you know, usually when we're in a, a healthy market, or I'm a little bit more confident. I have 10 to 12 longs on. Now I have three or four, so I'm pretty flexible. And as of right now, if you look, the spies are below um, this 521. So yesterday I was talking about if 521 breaks, you know, we could at least see 519, 49, 518, or, and ultimately, you know, why not a test of the 516 area, which in perspective seems like a lot right here, or if you're too long right here. But overall, when you look at the weekly chart, you know, SP was up 10% last quarter. Historically, you know, over time, you see 8, 9% a year, let alone. 10% in, in a quarter after a 28% move, you know, over the past year or since those October lows. Got what? it. I mean, so the average, the S&P goes up about an average of 9% a year or so. And we basically had that in the first quarter. I mean, do you think- or eight, To be honest, if I'm going to be perfect, which I'm never perfect, but I think over time, the last right. hundred years, I think the historical average is like 7-8%. Seven, eight percent. Okay, I think I was going off the last like two decades, which has probably been you know a little bit better market conditions than uh, you know the overall historical average. Sounds but right. do you think you know there's a chance we just kind of like chop around till we end the year around that average, and we've already got the big run up in, in Q1 and these? Uh, I mean, like where where do you see us going the rest of the year? 
Well, for me, I'm a trader, so I go like day by day, week by week, you know, quarter by quarter, but also as a chief strategic officer, people like calls. I could see us, you know, if we were up 10, you give back two or three, and I don't think that the high of this quarter is going to be the high of 2024, but we're, we're, in, a, we're in a tricky little spot here because, you know, most, most of the street prognosticators thought we'd have four or five rate cuts. And with inflation being sticky and and rates now back at 4.3, less than four in the 10 year, you know, it's harder to ignore. So that's why we're going to start seeing a little bit more pressure in the small caps. We've seen some pressure in the bios. And after a 10 percent move, you know, and, and oil at what, 88, it's going to be hard for the Fed to uh, to lower rates. So I have a feeling we're going to have to come in a little bit prior to finally them maybe cutting in June. So at this point, I feel like the next three months, or at least until earnings season can be very choppy. I mean, if we come in a little bit, it's probably better than being priced for perfection. And I think rates are starting to matter again, and oil is starting to matter again, because it's really shown that, you know, inflation is a little sticky here. So uh, it's hard for the Fed to cut rates. And then you know, you PE still elevated, and you just had a historic high in the S&P. So it makes a recipe for, you know, not being in a rush as, as a trader with excessive risk. Got it. And if you guys do want to trade live with Scott all week, it is virtual trading floor. As you can see on the banner there, we've got the QR code you can scan as well as the link in the chat. Scott, do you mind telling the audience a little bit more about what they'd get when they joined that room? Well, as of like right now, um, you know, I've been here since uh, since 630 in the morning. Traders log in and by the time the market opens, there's about four or five hundred traders that usually trade for a living. So that means they're looking for the action, they're looking for news, they're looking for what's in play and everyone interacts together. I can actually even give you a, a, a sneak peek of it here if I put this in oh, here. Yeah, nice. These are the guys that are talking. I post about 40 charts up here. Like I just posted TSM, which has been kind of strong where I give a little bit of an active take. You know, be long verse here, add through there. You know, so that you have the semis, um, then you have like, you know, uh, it's like, let's while we're here, let's talk NVIDIA. NVIDIA has been my favorite stock to play. You know, three years ago, I was the Apple trader. Two years ago, the Tesla trader. And the last year, it's been NVIDIA talking about what's important for today. You know, if you're active, 891 today for me seems like a, a key spot. You know, are we going to hold 891 and go green for cash flow? Are we going to break 891 and then turn into you know, more of a bigger channel down to 850 or 861. So, you know, all of this gets posted there all morning after the 630 club, and then everyone talks about news and what they're doing. Then they get to see some leftover positions. Like I said to you before, I shorted some premium as a hedge. I'm long some spy puts as a hedge. And then I, I, I still have a little Amazon on, you know, that acted a little better. Google still acted a little bit better. I still have a lot of silver on, you know, silver's working well. So basically yeah. it's everyone hanging out together talking about stocks, talking about news, fun. and talking about life, having some fun and trying to make each other money, you know, because, you know, a thousand eyeballs are better than two in your basement or two if you happen to be working on a prop desk in Goldman Sachs. What about a head of shoulders here on NVIDIA someone's asking about? A head and shoulders in the video. We could check that out. Yeah, uh, it's kind of, you know, a little bit more working on the right so shoulder there. I could kind of see the left. I mean... You did have that spike high. Someone asked about that. I don't see that at all. I yeah, see, I see a high here. I see a channel. You know, if you remember NVIDIA, people forget how long NVIDIA was in this channel over here before it broke out, right? This channel was a long channel, you know, in NVIDIA, you know, before it broke out. Remember this move all the way down from here? Well, it went sideways for a long time to, to absorb the PE, absorb the supply, you know, here was a breakout failure, breakdown failure. Remember this red dog reversal down here when everyone got bearish, people were talking about that head and shoulders top pattern. Then you had to move too far, too fast, finally made a low, a higher low, and then you broke out. So my my thought is, as an active trader, is how long is it going to be in here? You know, and I'm not going to have FOMO. I'm, I'm going to be taking trades. I'm not going to act like I'm this huge hedge fund portfolio guy with billions of dollars where I'm accumulating a position. I'm not. I'm going to be trading this. And as of now, 891 for today is important. Does Can you buy it to go green for a trade? Does it break below and get people short and reclaim it? Or does it break below and hold below and then see 878 and then 861 and then this is the bottom end of the channel? So those are my three thoughts as I come in today as an active prop trader who trades for a living with NVIDIA, which has been one of the key stocks to, to measure sentiment and risk in overall tech. 
So, Scott, if the market does, and I mean, I don't want to make too much out of this morning's price action, but if the market does start to, you know, lose some steam, maybe the buy the dip isn't working as well, what are other ways that retail traders can, you know, trade the market and still make money while the market's either going sideways or going down a little bit? They could try and get short if they're good at it. They could sell calls or they could sit in some cash because cash is a position. Every trader has their strengths that they play to. I'm usually like 75% long, 25% short. I'm not the best short. So I'm not always, you know, I'm not, I don't have FOMO missing a short. But when the market feels like it's coming in and you're starting to break the 21 day, I'll have less risk on. I'll do less. I'll pick better spots and I'll take trades. When the market's trending, I'll have a lot of risk on. I'll let the market make me money. I'll add through levels when price patterns trigger. But when the market feels like this, you know, it's just as important to sit back, drink some iced coffee and watch things than over trade and feel like you have to push the envelope. Because, you know, if you push the envelope and you lose 10, 20 grand in a month or more, then you have to make that back before you get paid the month after if the price action is a little bit more conducive to your style. But markets do go up and down. So you have to learn how to short. And, you know, you have to look for some H cell setups and you have to maybe, like I said, if People might make money short in NVIDIA today, right? NVIDIA right now is at 891. If it gets below and stays below, you know, maybe you could be short and perhaps it sees a move to the 21 day, which is 878. If it gets below and you're like, oh, it's below 891, I could short it, goes to 889 and then reclaims 891 and reclaims that battle spot, then all of a sudden you could lose money short and then all of a sudden tomorrow it's lower. So it, 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 it's tricky to be short, but there are ways to make money if you, if you have those type of strategies in your in your you know tactical tool belt as a prop trader, yeah, you got to have more. Uh, you know, you, you got to have some some extra tools in that tool belt, like you said. If you're just doing one thing all the time and it's been working for a while, and then it stops working. You can't expect that. Um, do you have any other uh, specific names outside of Nvidia you've been watching for potential trades today? Yeah, you know what, Google was strong yesterday. You know, Google had a nice candle breakout. Some of some of them in my community have been long it since the gap up post that Apple Gemini news. So Google wound up hitting a high of 155, clean, clean, nice wide range bar. So if the market's not going to fall apart today, this is something that probably could hold the 153 ish area to go green. So I would think maybe Google for cash flow, you could buy it to go red to green. Um, Amazon's been pretty good. You know, it has been great. It's not a barn burner. I did sell a bunch into the strength yesterday above 183. So I'll see if I could, you know, I could add versus spot. But if, you know, if Amazon breaks the eight day, chances are, you know, this upper momentum might be kind of lost and it might test a 21 day. So I'll be out of the way. A lot of traders think they could like go from long to out and flip short. And then all of a sudden they lose long and then they, you know, press at the bottom and then they get screwed up. Then they lose Shop both up. long and short. And I don't like to do that. So I'm not going to flip short in Amazon. But you know, I'll see if it continues to pay me to sit and massage my position or I just have to wait for a better market. Scott, one characteristic of this market has just been the rotation, right? Um, especially over the last week or so, if does you know, the AI trade or the IW app, we really haven't had a day where they sell everything. <laughs> and those are the kind of days that you have to really take note. Uh, I'm looking That's today. That's coming today. Yeah. <laughs> That's coming right now. <laughs> We've got to sell everything pre market. I'll tell you that. Only holding up right now is oil. TLT is getting I, hammered. <laughs> Stop, I want to get Scott's thoughts on the TLT I, here because this yeah. is a serious move down for the TLT right now. I That's mean, funny, it kind this... of came out of nowhere. Yesterday, we get hammered. Follow through here today, breaching 92 support here. Everybody, including myself, thought, you know, long term rates are going to start to go down. This is not the case. This is the opposite happening. You're catching a lot of people here, Scott. What are your thoughts on the TLT? You got some technicals for me? Yeah. You know what? The funny thing is, he says that yesterday, for the first time in like a month, I actually did the chart of the TLT because <laughs> rates haven't really mattered. The TLT hasn't really mattered for like four to six weeks. Uh -huh. And if you focused on there, you missed so much else. And then yesterday, I'm like, you know what? The 10 year is going up above a level. Inflation sticky. This is going to matter. So I actually did the chart of the TLT nice. yesterday. Exactly. Like right here. I drew this yesterday and this was my language. Felt like the market was getting a, a kind of comfortable with the 10 year around 4.4.1. Not sure if we would like it. If we work back to 5%, TLT had a gap and go to the downside. 92 area is pretty big. If that doesn't hold, 
the market might not like it. And that was yesterday. I posted it on my Twitter. I posted wow. it in here. And here's that 92 level. And as you just said, <laughs> the TLT is gapping below it. And if, if, if the TLTs don't go from kind of red to green and it continues to, to lower from this level, chances are it's going to matter again. And it'll be something that the traders use or I use as a key indicator, you know, to figure out, uh, you know, what kind of risk tolerance we could have because markets don't like when new ranges get established and when new ranges get established, you have to watch the, the, the price discovery. So like you just said, that was very important. This was a key level. It's broken. You know, I guess 8960 is kind of a level below, but below that really there's, there's not a whole lot. It's below all the moving averages now. So, you know, inflation's kind of sticky here and it's going to be hard for the, you know, for the, the Fed I to agree. cut rates in June with the S&P 1% of all time high. So something's got to shake out. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and we'll see labor data later this week. So unless you get a big surprise to the downside there, then, you know, I don't know what really uh, why the Fed would have any reason. But um, all right, Scott, we've been on the line again with Red Dog Scott Redler from T3 Trading. Again, you got that QR code on the screen there if you want to check that out. You can also hit the link in the description to go hang out with Scott all week in his virtual trading floor. He showed us it. I mean, that looks exciting. I'm, I'm not... Uh, I might need to come check that out, you know, when I get in the office around 6 45, 7 in the morning, so I can get you more. don't get in the office. Well, I, will, I, I, I will if I will if I get all these great trade ideas. <laughs> yeah. Get this on that phone. There's strength get in numbers. But I, you know, we have professionals on from all over the world. You know, these guys yeah. aren't, you know, in the Alpha team that you know, a lot of them have been trading for a living for 10, 15, 25 years. Some of them have better actual ideas than I do because I'm focused on a lot of things. So you know, the more guys that come in who've been trading for a living, the, the better it is with strength in numbers. It gives you conviction and, you know, it points to cool stuff. So you should come on, Aaron. You'd be awesome. Joel, I'd love to have you guys on and interact with my guys, too. You know, I come visit you guys. Come visit us. All right. Let's do it, Joel. We got to we'll, we'll get up extra early one day this week and do that. Scott, thank you again for hopping on. We'll chat soon. OK, sounds great. Thanks for having me. Of course. All right, guys, we've got about eight minutes left. Like you said, I mean, we had uh, we it had, goes uh, back to this. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Go. I was just going to say we, we yesterday was a good day to end up talking about value with the rally we're seeing in, in oil again today. Yeah. I don't know what you were going to no, say. It goes, it, my Internet connection just tipped out. Hopefully it's OK. Uh, it goes back to this TLT conversation. I think nothing matters right now except the TLT. It didn't matter to Red Dog's point. It hasn't mattered for a month because it's been going nowhere. Even two months. It's really been going nowhere. We started breaking down in the TLT. This is a serious, serious issue for the IWM. And if you're wondering why, we talked about this yesterday on the show in the pre-market. And this is why I also listen to pre-market prep. Because we talked about the TLT going down in the pre-market. And I'm like, well, this is kind of a tell. IWM, the market was trading higher yesterday. And I'm like, I'm kind of nervous about buying stocks because the TLT is going down. Now we, you know, it sold off all day, closed near the lows. Now we get another buck of follow through here. This is okay, not buck. like, you know, 1% who cares. This is a serious move. 1% on the TLT is a serious move and has repercussions for the overall market. If you are wondering what, why is the S&P so weak today? Why is the IWM getting hammered? What, what I don't understand. You're not looking at the TLT. This, this entire sell off here today is TLT driven. It is now taking control of the car. They're like, nope, AI, you're not driving the bus right now. I'm driving the bus. It's about rates here all of a sudden again. It's about inflation again. So here we are. You look at another buck. You're breaching support to Red Dog's point. Your fantastic points he was making, the 92. We've talked about that level here too. Breaching it here in the pre-market. You better get back up there in a hurry because if you don't, this market could actually, it's a crowded long too. It's it set is. up. Just to punish some longs here, actually, from a trading perspective, I'm selling rallies and maybe even looking at what hasn't sold off yet and maybe lightening up and getting some cash here in a hurry. You know, um, uh, Josh, who uh, helps me out at premarketprep.com and, uh, you know, Fool's Rally yesterday, right? April Fool's Day. Oh, there you go. Uh-oh, Joel. Got the mute trick again, I think. I don't He's see not the... muted. It, yeah. I don't know. Uh, that's the weird. Okay, so Joel. Okay, Joel's gonna figure that out. He's not muted. I don't know. Oh yeah, he is. He is muted. He's got some tog on the keyboard. We're gonna like whip him, you know, backstage so, here. And yeah, because there he is. 
I, I guess are, are sort of the bond traders just essentially betting that there will be some sort of, you know, I don't want to say recession, but slow down that the, the Fed's not. I mean, I uh, think they're betting that we haven't beat inflation. I think the bond traders are making a bet that inflation maybe isn't beaten here yet. I mean, they look at oil prices and how long was it going to be before they start getting nervous about oil? How long was it going to be? Because that's one tangible thing that the consumer can go and look. When I gas up at the pump, I'm like, oh my gosh, when did the gas prices come back up here again? Yeah. Inflation's back. And then that kills sentiment. So, I mean, this oil rally is probably one of the main reasons, Aaron, that we're starting to see TLT start to sell. It's starting to take note. We have went up substantially here. Oil is up here again this morning. And now bond traders are getting nervous that oil is going to start to matter here again. So that's one tangible thing. But we know even just going places and doing stuff, inflation is sticky. It's hard to get rid of. Labor inflation never goes away. It's always there because you're always going to go to your employer and say, hey, look, things are costing me more money. I need a raise. And then the raise, you know, you need to go product. The vicious cycle that we've talked about again and again and again. But I mean, we can say, oh, yes, inflation is dead, you know, from the statistics, but it's not. The prices never go down. They just aren't going up as quickly. But we're right. still talking about a 4% number here. We're not talking, you know, 3%. Okay, well, it's down if we take out. But, you know, the housing costs, the way the whole damn thing's calculated is so crooked in the first place. You know, we take out whatever the hell we can. You know, well, we'll take out gas or this number. Or we'll, you know, we'll look at, you know, the renter's equivalency instead of actually looking at housing prices, which are so much higher than they were before. And that's the biggest expense for everybody out there. So... I think we're just at a point where the market is starting to take note that inflation is not dead. And that's why you're starting to see weakness here. And we got stocks sitting up here near all-time highs across the board. We did this exercise yesterday. If you're, you're like, again, my long-term portfolio is sitting way, you know, it's, just, it's, it's had an awesome first quarter. So if you're getting a little bit nervous, you start seeing the TLT going down. I'm a money manager. I'm raising some cash today. The, you know, the narrative has been when are rates going lower, when are rates going lower, when are rates going lower. And then, you know, what we've tried to say, and someone said we change your mind every day. I've been consistent rates. I, the, the stuff that Powell was shoveling at us about, you know, these rates, it just been his pivot when he pivoted. It hasn't he learned anything from COVID in all these years, man. You got to save your bullets in the chamber. First of all, we don't have inflation under control. Right, and you see that no. in some in some of the numbers, you see oil ripping, and uh, you know that's why you know it's just hard to put money to uh, to work. But you know, based on the thesis, the just rates are coming down. That was an easy play. That was a play for years and for decades that lower rates were going to stimulate the market. That's not the play. We're never going back down to those rates. Never. Oh, we ever, may, George. Ever. Don't. I. I'm gonna give you the. Uh, the okay. We will go back down to those rates when the economy goes into a serious recession. Zero. But we're not there. I don't know. Japan's again, still I mean, almost I, at I, zero. I, the, the, the close labor. to it. I think we could go back down there. I don't think it's. I'm, I don't think that's completely dead. We're gonna be in a world rates, of hurt if we do. I don't think so. I'm gonna say this. You know, we're okay. sitting here looking at what? You know, we're four and a half on the long term here. We were five when they, you know, we had the Rick Santali talk in 13, which was pure stupidity. Um, we're not going to 13 or 12 or 10 or 11. This market, the economy can't handle that. We've proven, though, that we can handle five. We've mm -hmm. proven this economy can handle five. So to Joel's point, he's making a very good point here. Rates are, uh, are, are not going back down to zero for the foreseeable future because we've proven that it creates problems, creates excessive bubbles, creates inflation. So I don't think unless there's a serious crisis, and that means the stocks are a hell of a lot lower, that the rates are going down to zero. I don't think we're going to 8 to 10 because I don't think the market can handle it up there either. Maybe I'm wrong. I, was, I didn't think it could handle 5, and it does. But to your point, maybe we're going to be 4, 3.5, 4, time. 5 for a long time. Maybe mm -hmm. the free money parade is officially over. Maybe, just maybe, you know, with the deficit of 33 or $34 trillion, I can't keep track of it, it goes up a trillion a month. Just maybe we need to have a less excessive spending, not only by consumers, but by governments. Maybe, just maybe. So not saying we're falling off a cliff here, but here we are at all-time highs. It's kind of nice to be turning a little bit bearish at an all-time high. We've been pretty bullish on this show. I've been bullish for a while. NASA, everything. I'll tell you right now, it's as nervous as I've been right now. As, as, as a whole year, I've been like, you know, you've been telling me sell my Nvidia, sell this. And it's been the wrong calls. 
You know, the people every day, somebody tells, sell your NVIDIA, sell your NVIDIA. It's been wrong. Dead wrong. You've been wrong. All you people on NVIDIA Bears have been wrong. But I tell you right now, not NVIDIA is then the stock that's going to get hit the hardest. But I tell you right now, if you don't have any cash, I'd be finding a way to raise some cash right now because there could be some issues here. I think we could stumble here a bit. I don't think we're crashing. I don't think we're going down 20% on the S&P. But could we have a 5 to 10% correction from here, Joel? Absolutely. Five to ten percent correction. I mean, from all time, from here on the spy would be would be pretty significant. Again, I four seventy five, four eighty on the spy, four ninety. That's doable, and I, I would I would reload there because I don't think we're you know just done and dead in the water here, and this is the end. Yeah, uh, but I think well, if you're I think if you're a hundred, I think if you're invest on margin here, get off margin. I think at this point in time, it's been a good first quarter. Get off margin, book some profits. Not. Maybe you're going to get a rally tomorrow. It seems like you never have to sell in the hole. We're down 33 points. Maybe you get a pop back mm-hmm. up. But give a perspective here. I mean, we're where we were on the S&P two days ago. So you're selling. Even if you're selling the hole today, you're still basically selling at all-time highs. If you're if you're sitting on all in, I'd, I'd raise some cash at this point. I'm yeah, saying that today. It's so as with- I've been all year. There have been some whispers about, you know, some some weakness in the labor market. We'll get those job numbers later this week. We haven't seen any of that in, da- in the data yet, but a lot of experts and economists have been saying that's weakening. So that could be one thing, you know, down the road a month or two where if we continue or if we start to get um, bad labor data, that could, you know, in, in, encourage the Fed to maybe cut even when inflation's not there. So, but I, I, I'm, I'm not sure that would then necessarily help the markets if they're cutting rates on the backdrop of, of, you know, a, a weakening labor market. It, the, the rate cuts would be great for market if it's because, okay, everything's going great and inflation's falling down to 2%. So now we can cut rates a quarter percent, not as great if we're cutting a quarter percent because you need to. So, um, just something to watch there. We will get those numbers here on Friday. So make sure to yeah, in the keep in mind, account. keep in mind, we did have a lot of layoffs. I mean, that hit the news, right? Um, you know, earlier in the year, it did, you know, meta, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of big companies were cutting yeah. and it doesn't, you know, when it, in the company's got a reaction, oh, they're cutting jobs. That's good for the bottom line. But it takes a while for those numbers to filter through. And one thing that kept me off the recession bandwagon was the employment numbers, right? And they've been holding pretty strong. Right. So, you know, once you see that start to creep up and, it, you know, there's a lag effect. So we'll get some more information on Friday, certainly on that. Uh, we're trying to find the bottom here in the S&Ps and uh, we haven't certainly found it yet. We've even taken out last week's low at uh, 52.63. So if you want to get your rally cap on at all, you gotta you gotta take out that uh, uh, get back above that pre-market low for 52.63 for a little bit of a rally. Let's Joel, just do- clarify here today too. Is everybody's thinking this is the day that Nvidia is going down 20 percent, and this is the day. Nvidia is not the stock that's going to get hit the hardest here today. I don't nope. think Nvidia is not as sensitive to interest rates as all these other stocks where people have been crowding into this catch-up trade. Maybe everybody's been talking all year about the IWM catch-up trade. Maybe this is not the place to be raising cash from. Maybe it's actually the IWM that's had a pretty good last couple of weeks here rallying up. Maybe it's the banks. You know, we're all like, oh, the banks, yeah, rates, you know, we're going to go. Well, you know, all of a sudden, this is why people say we change our mind all the time. You know what, folks? It's our job to change our mind. As a trader, I need to be changing my mind continuously for new information. The new information today is a TLT is breaking down. That means no thank you, KRE. No thank you, banks. No thank you, solar. Stuff we talked about yesterday morning saying, hey, this stuff sets up pretty good. Then the TLT collapsed. Okay. Tesla going out of business. Is Tesla going out of business here? What's going on? Yeah, let's get the Tesla numbers. All right. Let me get those pulled up real quick. It is 9.04 a.m. Well, I'm pulling that up, Joel. Why don't you tell us who we got coming on the show with us tomorrow? Oh, we got a special treat coming on. We got a voice of reason, nice, calm. You hear us screaming and yelling all day. We got uh, Amarine Ban coming on, and she's going to give us uh, her her uh, even-tempered perspective um, on the market. Yep. Yeah, she was great during – Hopefully, this is not symptomatic of when we had her on uh, during uh, what was that thing a few years? Oh, COVID. 
Uh, we had her on a lot during that. So she'll be joining us uh, tomorrow. The Tesla numbers, I'm not even going to ask about. Uh, boy, well, Dennis, so I got, I've got the numbers, but I don't see what, what, what the market, what the street was expecting. So I don't know if we're going to have a great contact. So deliveries uh, were 386,000. Deliveries just reported right now, 386,000. Yep. And then Yes, it was 449. That was the 70, 60, 000, Yep. 449,000. In the Q1, they delivered 433. They were expecting 449 here. But Philip Bo, cow. again, Philip Bo being the genius that he is. You listen to Philip Bo. He is really good. He was saying they're let, the numbers are coming down the overall estimates here. They don't think they're going to hit that number. They didn't just not hit that number. They missed that number by a landslide here, folks. 386 versus 449. Holy. Again, Tesla's its own animal. It's its own stock. We know it has had bad numbers before. And then, you know, for whatever reason, they just come back in and buy the stock anyways. But, wow, this is a mess, folks. This is a mess. Yeah, and they low, produce. Yeah, low of the move, 160.76. The company produced 433,000 and delivered approximately 387. So I don't know if that just takes a while for them to deliver all the all the cars that they produce. But for a while... Tesla was delivering, selling every single car the company produced. It was just a matter of, of, of keeping up, ramping up production and keeping up with that demand. But if you start to see, which we've started to see some of these kind of, uh, you know, inventory problems where Tesla's cutting prices, trying to sell these cars, that's a big problem for the company because the the big kicker, the, the thing that's always made it trade at a higher valuation than the other car companies, well, I know, you know, people will say Tesla's not a car company, but is that its margins have been way better but if you start cutting prices, your margins aren't going to be as good anymore. So something to watch for there. If Tesla starts having inventory problems, demand problems. Margins are going down. Margins are going down. Then that's like a a, 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 a a bad storm of things going on for investors, if, if that's the case. So we'll see here. Uh, again, Tesla getting crushed today. And it's not a good day to report bad delivery numbers, right? Oh, there are there certain days. This is the worst day to be reporting bad numbers. Yeah, I mean, at it, certain days, the Tesla report says the stock probably doesn't even move that much. But all right, come in tomorrow. Tune in for Anne Marie Band. By the way, Anne Marie said in the chat today that she has a 500 plus day Wordle streak going. So, oh my gosh, I guess Wordle's not just a fad for everyone. For some people, it's a lifestyle. I'm still on there playing it every day as well, Anne Marie. So, uh, we will chat tomorrow morning. Quick guys. level for Tesla 160 is a big number here. Yep. It needs to bounce there, it needs to hold there. Breach of 160 would be breaching critical support, making new 52 week lows of a breach of that 160. I would, I, I am not buying the dip here on Tesla today. Um, I still own a very small piece, but we know I sold into the last rally. I talked about it, I lightened up because I'm just not liking the car. Obviously, you know, I like the humanoid story here, but it's too far away. And they've got too many problems with obviously, you know, deliveries here and numbers and cars. And I 387 versus 4, 449. This is a major miss folks. This isn't just a little miss. This is a major miss here for Tesla. I don't think they buy the dip today in Tesla. I don't think it goes back up. There you go. Well, all right, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Make sure to smash the like if you haven't already. We do have live trading starting up right after this. Stay tuned to hang out with Ryan Faluna, Zunaid, and the crew. We will see you guys tomorrow morning.